We've heard much over the last two days about plagues and about medicine and the use of drugs to combat disease in general, and viruses in particular. And this caused me to pause and reflect on the origins of medicinal chemistry. Many attribute the foundations of medicinal chemistry to a young scholar born in 1493, Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. Fortunately, he went under the name of Paracelsus. <laughs> Paracelsus, from around 1507 till his death in 1541, was a wandering scholar who practiced medicine, probably without the benefit of a medical degree, in Switzerland and southern Germany, and is given credit for first recognizing that diseases were often caused by foreign entities entering the body, and that effective treatment must involve treatment of the foreign entity. Over the following century or so, a vigorous debate among eminent scholars in Europe revolved around whether the approaches championed by the Paracelsians were better than the more classical approaches espoused by the traditionalist Galen based on the balance of the humors in the body. This debate led to the acceptance of the basic concepts of Paracelsus and was truly the birth of medicinal chemistry. The design and quantitation of drugs to combat diseases um, and things like that came from the, this early work. Some Paracelsians unfortunately took his teachings a little too literally and a number of Europeans were known to have bled to death while their physicians carefully cleaned the sword, the agent of the disease, that had just run them through, um, rather than treat the symptoms of the disease itself. Um, Joseph Duchesne, who lived in the latter part of the 16th century, wrote of the need of physicians to travel in order to learn of local diseases, under the strange sweating sickness in England, of colic in Alsatia, and a new fever in Hungary, eerily prescient of the stories we have already heard about and will continue to hear about at this conference. You may wonder what this has to do with the introduction of our next speakers, but I would like to make the argument that today you have already heard in Bob Gallo's wonderful talk this morning and will continue to hear in the presentation by Betsy and Gary Narble this afternoon, the continued rumblings of a new revolution in medicine that I will call medicinal biology as opposed to medicinal chemistry. And it is perhaps fitting that as we prepare to enter a new millennium, that it is approximately half a millennium since the birth of medicinal chemistry was fired by the inquisitive nature of physicians. Both Betsy and Gary Nabel are physicians. They are also outstanding research workers. They work together, they work separately, and are at the cutting edge of this new revolution in medicinal biology. Betts' credentials include being one of only two women in the nation to hold the position of Chief of Cardiology. Betsy at the University of Michigan, where they both are on the faculty, and I believe the other is in California. Betts' research focuses on gene expression and gene transfer in vascular tissue, and as you will hear, is aimed towards genetic interve intervention in the treatment of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Gary, also at the University of Michigan in the Departments of Biological Chemistry and Internal Medicine is an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Michigan and one of the architects of the Center for AIDS Research that coordinates research activities in that particular area in much of the Midwest. His research focuses on the coordinate regulation of gene expression during development and as you will hear has significant impact on both Ebola and HIV. Each has both independently and together published many papers in their fields of research. They have held numerous NIH grants and perhaps equally importantly have trained and mentored many successful scientists and physicians. Rather than read you a long list of their other accomplishments, I will end by saying that their work together has been recognized by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and in 1995 they were awarded the Amgen Scientific Achievement Award for their work in initiating and extending the concepts of medicinal biology. It's a great honor and privilege to introduce our next speakers, Betsy and Gary Nabel. And I think Gary is gonna start the proceedings. <laughs> 
Thank you, Ellis. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, President Stoyer, uh, John Lambert, and the organizers of the meeting for uh, inviting us here today. It, it truly is an honor to join the distinguished speakers here and uh, on this very uh, lively and, and most uh, timely topic of the uh, conference. I'd also like to say a special hello to our family uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, as well as our many friends, uh, both here that we've met during the meeting and, and from before uh, around the state. Uh, and in particular, also uh, to thank the two student uh, hosts that we've had here, Ann Miller and Mark Newell, for their wonderful hospitality. We couldn't have survived here without you. Um, like the mythological god Janus, who had two faces, um, what, in part what we'd like to do for you this afternoon is to look forward and to look backwards. Uh, what we would like to do is basically draw upon our past uh, in virology, a past which I think was very elegantly summarized by Bill Joklik, uh, and at the same time that we move to the future and uh, try to develop new approaches both to viral diseases, to uh, acquired human diseases, and begin to use uh, genes to treat disease uh, and in, in the newer discipline now called gene therapy. I should also say uh, that those of us in research uh, very much understand, I think, a point that Bill really was trying to uh, bring out yesterday, that in science we are always, uh, we, we always owe a debt of gratitude that is, uh, that is really uh, impossible to give enough acknowledgement to, and that's to the people who came before us, to the, the, the discipline. We all, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, it's said, and I think that Bill really outlined uh, the, the many achievements in molecular virology that preceded us, and I think many of the speakers today uh, and yesterday uh, themselves have, are, are some of those giants whose shoulders we happily climb on top. Um, let me start with the first slide. One of the attractions for us to study viruses is their elegance uh, and their simplicity. Um, here a virus is shown. This is actually the human immunodeficiency virus. This is a colorized version. I should in indicate that we don't really know that these colors are real or have anything to do with reality, uh, but they look nice. And I think they bring out the, uh, the point that um, the virus is a, a highly organized structure. Uh, it has, it's a simple structure, and its genetic complexity actually pales in comparison to its host cell. Here you have HIV, the, you can almost see the protrusions of the viral envelope, the highly glycosylated sugar-containing protein that now interacts with these receptors on its host cell, the CD4 molecule and the chemokine receptors that you heard about earlier. Um, as I said, the complexity here of the genome of the virus is, is minimal compared to the host cell that it's about to infect. Uh, our genomes contain three billion bits of genetic information, three billion nucleotides. The HIV genome contains 10,000. That means that there's 30,000 times more genetic information in this cell that the virus is about to infect compared to the virus itself. And yet, this virus, despite the fact that it has just a fraction of the amount of genetic information, is completely lethal to its host, to its host cell, and to the host organism, <clears throat> as we've seen shown very dramatically in the case of HIV. Uh, genetically, this virus is about to do to the cell and to its host uh, what, what um, is, is really, in, in physical terms, almost unimaginable. Uh, it's the equivalent of uh, sinking the Titanic, not with an iceberg, but really with a one well-placed nail. And so those of us who study viruses have a lot of uh, respect for their um, organization uh, and for what we can do, what they can do biologically, and how we can learn from them to modify biologic systems. What we're going to tell you about today are applications of viruses to gene therapy, there really are four basic ways in which viruses help us in this regard. First of all, they provide models to help us define the pathogenesis of disease, the, the underlying uh, rules that, and, and the underlying regulation that causes disease. 
It helps us to define gene function. Perhaps uh, this has been no more evident than in the studies of malignancy, but also, as you heard this morning, uh, in infectious disease. Uh, in addition to serving as models for understanding disease, the viruses can serve as models for developing gene delivery vehicles, both virally based vehicles as well as modified vehicles or synthetic vehicles that are non-viral in origin. Gene therapy, in fact, can potentially be used to treat viral disease, either through genetic vaccines, and I'll show you an example of this uh, in the latter part of my talk related to Ebola virus. And it also can be used uh, for treating uh, viral infections by introducing antiviral genes that block the replication of virus. And I'll talk a little bit about this with relationship to HIV. And in the last part, we get into the specific disease applications. Obviously, uh, this, can, this gene delivery approach can be applied both to inherited diseases as well to, as to acquired diseases. And Bessie will really go in quite uh, considerable detail into the applications of vectoring and gene delivery, both to cardiovascular disease and to cancer. Now, in many ways, the virus infection for us uh, serves as the paradigm for the development of gene therapy, in that normally, when a virus infects a cell and the viral genetic material is delivered into the cell, it is taken up in the nucleus, as Bob Gallo mentioned this morning, it becomes part of our own chromosomes. And then, by doing so, this virus, or at least from the case of retroviruses, uh, it can now direct the synthesis of gene products that were not normally resident within the cell that are needed by the virus and then promote its replication so it can then go on and complete uh, the life cycle. When we attempt to intervene genetically in a disease, we want to do much the same thing that the virus does. We want to add a gene to the cell that it normally didn't contain, that it normally did not inherit from its mother cell, uh, deliver that gene into the cell where we can regulate its expression, but it, now we've done so in such a way that we disable the virus's ability to make its own proteins that promote its own replication and instead substitute genes that will be of benefit to the host. And this is really the concept of gene therapy and the reason that viruses to us uh, provide a nice paradigm for developing this field. Now, the virus in its host cell does not live in a vacuum. It needs to adjust to the patterns and the programs of gene expression that the host cell contains. And all of our cells in our bodies are constantly making decisions about what to do, whether they need to go on and to divide and give rise to daughter cells that, for example, in the case of blood, may give rise to new blood cells that we use to repopulate uh, our hematopoietic system each day. Or they may make uh, decisions to respond, to not divide, but to differentiate or become activated and respond to stresses that we may, we may encounter, stresses uh, such as, as an infection, stresses like a sunburn, uh, stresses like a traumatic accident. And in the course of evolution, the viruses really have adapted themselves so that they can exist within this environment. And it's important to us in the context of gene therapy to understand these strategies and then to utilize them uh, for our own purposes. This is a topic that my lab has been interested now in for many years, over a dozen years, alluded to uh, briefly this morning by Bob, and that is the regulation of HIV gene expression in a latently infected cell. This is a problem we actually began to work on uh, now more than a dozen years ago. And it's a problem whose interest has now uh, returned in the minds of many individuals because what we've recognized is that when HIV infects a cell, there often are cells in the body where the viral genome will integrate and where the, uh, the for at least a portion of time, the virus will not make more viral proteins and go on to replicate. What we discovered many years ago is that there are actually cellular proteins that respond to stress and activation in a cell that release and activate cellular proteins that the virus then uses as a trigger to induce the synthesis of its own proteins. 
Uh, in our case, we've described a protein called NF-kappa B. It's a nuclear protein. It's called nuclear factor of kappa B because it was originally found in the nucleus to regulate the uh, kappa gene, which is one of the immunoglobulin genes in B cells. And when a cell receives a signal to become activated, this protein normally held in the cytoplasm is degraded and it migrates into the nucleus where it activates the expression of the virus. And so we've been trying to understand what is this complex interplay that regulates when HIV will become active, when it will be dormant. And I should add that this cell in particular now has become of great importance in HIV research because we know that with current antiviral drugs for HIV, we can eradicate almost all actively replicating virus. But what we're unable to uh, eradicate using conventional drugs right now are these latently infected cells. They're not making the viral proteins that make them susceptible to drugs. And we now need to begin to target the cell to eradicate uh, provirus that resides in the body. I won't speak any further about that topic, but what I will tell you is that this has presented an opportunity for some basic studies and a chance for us to understand a little bit about the mechanisms that regulate latency for HIV. And we've learned some interesting things. This is a crystal structure, an X-ray crystallographic structure from the Sigler lab at Yale and the Harrison lab at um, Harvard, uh, which shows the NF-kappa B protein. This actually shows it in the nucleus and this blue structure that you're looking at is actually the DNA double helix. And the NF-kappa B transcription factor forms this very elegant butterfly-like structure and it essentially cradles the DNA in its innermost surfaces. And it's when this transcription factor makes it into the nucleus and activates this sequence on HIV that transcription of the virus starts. But there's more to uh, this for HIV than simply the recognition of the enhancer region of HIV by the transcription factor. I mentioned that the virus has to survive in a cell that's making decisions about whether to divide or differentiate or to, uh, to stop its progression in the cell cycle. And I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but what we do know is that there are a number of important regulatory controls, cyclin-dependent kinases, retinoblastoma genes, and other proteins that determine whether a cell will progress on its division cycle. So normally if a cell's not dividing, it's in what we call G0. As it progresses through G1, it makes decisions about whether to synthesize DNA, which occurs here, then followed by the second growth phase and then mitosis. And in fact, viruses have had to learn to adapt to this innate biology of the cell. And in fact, what we've learned is that the cell ordinarily has very careful regulation on, and has what we call checkpoints at various times in the cell cycle. Uh, essentially, they're breaks. They're breaks on the cell as the cell progresses to say, okay, should I go on and synthesize uh, DNA at this point? And I, the cell then says, I will, I will generate a mechanism that will allow me to put a break on at the G1S interface or at the G2M interface, or on the switch between G0 and G1. And a variety of viruses, HIV certainly among them, have actually evolved in such a way that they can release these breaks. And so, for example, uh, adenovirus <coughs> uh, has one gene product that's called a coactivator, or P300, that essentially blocks the effect of a, tr of a cointegrator or an activator that pushes the cell out of the cycle. It essentially keeps it then in a more active cycling state. It has another gene product that inactivates the retinoblastoma protein, which is a break on this G1S phase and actually then pushes the cell into S phase. Now, the significance for this of adenovirus is that it allows the DNA synthetic machinery of the cell to be turned on. And since adenovirus is a DNA virus, uh, it essentially now has, has tweaked the cell to make the enzymes that the virus would want for its own replication. HIV actually do, does almost the opposite. HIV actually helps to apply a break at the G2M interface. And HIV, not being a DNA virus, doesn't really care about synthesizing more DNA in the cell. In fact, it wants to promote a state where 
there's more transcription, where there's more expression of the viral genome uh, when the cell arrests. And in fact, it does the opposite of what adenovirus does. NF-kappa B binds to this coactivator protein, and when the cell receives signals that cause it to growth arrest, this mechanism provides a means for the virus to increase the transcription of its virus of its, of its uh, viral genome and to enhance the replication of the virus. So viruses have developed very elegant strategies of surviving in this genetic jungle of their host cell. And for us, the challenge in gene therapy is to figure out how to make use of the innate biology of the virus uh, to optimize it for purposes of gene delivery and, in fact, for purposes of uh, therapy of different diseases. Now, one of the things that we need to do when we generate a virus or a viral vector is to make sure that it doesn't complete its life cycle. And in fact, this uh, electron micrograph shows the, again, the colorized version of HIV budding from a cell that's already been infected. And so in the first slide that I showed you, I showed you what we call the afferent phase of infection, where the virus brings its gen genetic information into the cell. This is the efferent phase, where it brings the genetic information out. For a vector to be successful, we have to make sure that we eliminate this phase of the virus life cycle. And this we do genetically uh, in the laboratory by essentially disabling critical viral genes. And this is done quite easily. I won't go into uh, the various strategies for different vectors, but suffice it to say that by taking any of the essential viral genes, for example, uh, there's one protein I'll tell you about in a minute called REV that's essential for transport of the viral RNA out of the nucleus. If we take that out of a virus, that virus is no longer competent to replicate. It can, a REV defective virus can deliver its genetic information into the cell. The genetic information can be incorporated stably, but it can't come out. And this, again, is probably one of the central concepts of gene therapy, which is that we need to use replication defective viruses or synthetic vectors that essentially transmit genetic information uh, only in one direction. Now, having said that, uh, we now have found in work that's gone on in many laboratories, n not only in the country but in the world, that almost any virus that you look at uh, is, becomes a potential vector in terms of delivering genes to cells. We have viruses that are DNA viruses and we have viruses that are RNA viruses and any one of them can be used and these have all been used in various different experimental models. Adenovirus is highly effective, can be grown to high titers, is particularly good at infecting non-dividing cells for some of the reasons I described briefly. It's also a big virus and so it can tolerate large pieces of DNA. In contrast to the adeno-associated virus, which is a parvovirus, and is very small, it can't tolerate big pieces of DNA, but it also is very good at integrating into cells and stably introducing the gene, where adenovirus really only gives transient uh, expression. Herpes viruses are probably a little bit more like the adenoviruses, vaccinia, you've heard about another class of the herpes viruses. Again, most of the DNA viruses, with the possible exception of adeno-associated viruses, uh, deliver large amounts of DNA into the cell, but they don't integrate into the host cell. This is in contrast to the retroviruses, particularly the murine retroviruses, which do. And more recently, as I'll tell you about later in the talk, we've learned that even our, our, our horrible foe, the AIDS virus, HIV, can be modified in such a way that it can be used as a vector and so that it can deliver therapeutic genes into cells. And uh, there are several uh, applications of this technology that are currently being investigated. And so to s just to give you an idea, what we really are doing in the laboratory is we're taking viral vectors that normally cause disease and applying them to treat the disease, to treat various diseases. Murine retroviruses are well known to cause cancer. Uh, the, uh, and by virtue of their biology and with modifications, we now can try to treat a variety of blood diseases and AIDS, and the list actually is probably even longer than that. 
The lentiviruses, which cause AIDS, are now being investigated in laboratories to treat central nervous system disorders, dementias, Parkinson's disease, blood clotting disorders, and, and AIDS as well. Adenoviruses, which normally cause respiratory infections, are being used to treat pulmonary diseases, to treat cancer, heart disease, muscular dystrophy. Uh, the adeno-associated viruses that are unknown to cause anemias and arthritis are being heavily used to investigate neurologic diseases. And in one of the applications that I'll show you later, simple naked DNA uh, derived from bacteria that cause infection are now being used in a number of cancer models and DNA vaccine models and also to treat arthritis. I should emphasize that we're in the very early stages of these treatments, so when I say therapeutic application, uh, I think you should all understand that these are really still under investigation and in their early phases. Now let me turn here to the first discussion of how a gene can be therapeutic, and it, this in the case of HIV. Uh, in the case of HIV, what we know is that the viral genome is integrated into the host cell, it's regulated by host transcription factors, and those host transcription factors normally control a whole range of cellular proteins that include cytokines and chemokines, like you heard about this morning, growth factor receptors as well. And somewhere buried in that, in that whole range of, of 10,000 to 100,000 uh, different gene products that the cell makes is this little HIV RNA molecule and a few derivatives of it that represent alternative splice products. And the question is, how do we then selectively target this particular viral gene so that it can be shut off while all of the good proteins in the, that are encoded by the good RNAs of the cell continue to be made? Here what we've done in the laboratory is turned to some of our knowledge about the biology of HIV. And in this case, what we've done is to take one of the essential viral proteins that I mentioned earlier called the Rev protein. Rev works as follows. Normally, when HIV is infecting a cell, and if one were to look in the nucleus of that cell, you would find an RNA that's present within the nucleus, and you'd have very low levels of the Rev protein that are being made. This RNA would be stuck in the nucleus, because without Rev, RNA export can't occur. Now, when the cell becomes activated, what happens is that the transcription of viral genes increases. There becomes a critical amount of REV that's made in the nucleus. REV now binds to what we call a REV responsive element. It's an RNA structure that's in the virus. It recruits in cellular proteins that then allow this to be brought out to the cytoplasm and for lytic replication to continue. Several years ago, our collaborator at Duke University, Brian Cullen, had described a mutant form of REV, which in some overexpression systems could actually uh, bind to the REV responsive element, uh, but it had a mutation that abolished its ability to interact with these cellular proteins. And so although it could bind to the REV region, it couldn't facilitate the export of the viral RNA out of the nucleus and so the virus was essentially stuck in this phase of the life cycle. Put in more simple terms, if you were to think uh, in, of this as REV being a key that you would put in the lock of your car to open your car, to let the RNA escape from the nucleus. If you, had, if or you or someone had gotten to the car before you and broken off a key in the lock, you wouldn't be able to open the lock. And so in molecular terms, that's really what the REV protein does. Now, when you introduce this gene into T cells, we've now shown that it has very dramatic effects on replication of HIV. Here's a cell culture in which these T cells that are normally uh, susceptible to infection to HIV have been genetically modified with this mutant form of the REV protein that blocks wild-type REV function. This has been genetically modified with a control vector that doesn't make that protein. They're then both challenged with virus. And we can look under the microscope uh, 10 to 14 days later. And what you see is in the cells that express REV, you see these small little round circles. These are intact growing cells. These are T leukemia cells that we use as the host of infection. In the control, you can see that these cells have started to 
die. There's debris in the culture. There's ballooning. There's fusion of cells. This is a typical uh, infected cell culture. So by modifying the genetic substrate of the T cell, we can turn a cell that's normally completely sensitive to HIV infection to one that's highly resistant. And this experiment has always been particularly striking to me because the only thing that keeps this cell culture from looking like this cell culture is the small mutation in the Rev protein. It, it's a simple mutation that changes only two amino acids in that protein. And I think by changing two amino acids in one protein, we can completely block infection. I think it points out the potential power of genetics as a tool if we can apply it and uh, deliver genes in the right way in vivo. So that became the next challenge for us, which was how do you then proceed from these very highly controlled, very um, rigorous conditions that we can set up in the laboratory to a patient where we, the levels may vary, may vary by sight, and, and do these genes have any chance in the patient of having an antiviral effect? Is this even a worthwhile area to pursue? Well, we, we've done a variety of different studies that I won't go through to, to uh, get to, just in the interest of time, to get to this point. But essentially, the goal of the research in the next phase was to really say, how can we ask the question in an infected individual of whether the gene can be beneficial to the cell that receives it? And we came up with an experimental design that essentially is a marking experiment. It's a gene marking experiment, where we take cells from an HIV-infected individual, we grow them in the laboratory, we split them into two groups. And essentially, we do exactly what I showed you on the last slide. In one group of cells, we introduce the vector that expresses the protective gene for HIV. In another group of cells, we put in a nearly identical vector, but it's been modified so that it can't make the protective gene. These are grown for a period of about 10 days to two weeks. They're mixed together and reinfused back into the patient. And then what we can do using PCR, very sophisticated molecular technologies, is we can actually distinguish the survival of this population of cells, the one that have received the protective gene, compared to its control. So essentially, we've been able to set up a study where the patient serves as their own control. And this then becomes informative, at least in terms of whether the effectiveness of the gene is something that we should pursue. I should point out this does not say anything about whether this strategy at this point will affect the clinical course of the disease. That will come downstream. But we've done this now in two trials. Uh, one, in both cases, uh, there are small trials, three trials, three patients per trial. But the take-home message is actually shown uh, here, three patients. They all basically show the same thing. If you look at the levels of, the, of cells that contain the Rev protein compared to the control vector, immediately after the reinfusion, after, as you would expect, there's no difference in the number of RevM10 containing cells compared to the control. But if you come back one week or two weeks later, what you find is that you can still detect the cells that contain the protective gene. You can no longer detect the cells that got the control gene. And here in one patient, you can actually look at a time course of the cells containing the protective gene compared to the control gene. And clearly, there's a survival advantage to the cells that receive this uh, in the HIV-infected individual. And so that tells us that the expression of this viral gene, this antiviral gene, in this HIV-infected individual can confer a survival advantage. We've been able to quantitate what that survival advantage is, and it turns out to be roughly a, a four- to five-fold increase in survival of these genetically marked cells uh, compared to a cell that received uh, this negative control. And so by using these molecular tools and using our knowledge of HIV, uh, we're able to essentially bootstrap ourselves to a point where we can begin to develop uh, antiviral treatments. I should point out that the goal here uh, is not necessarily to have this be a standalone therapy, that this type of an approach can be combined with existing drug treatments that would minimize viral loads. It can be 
combined with immunotherapies that would boost the pro proliferation of these cells in their host once they've been reintroduced. But I think the advantage of this approach, and I think as we're seeing this in HIV nowadays, that the cocktails of, of, of drugs that patients are taking for HIV are very difficult for patients to tolerate, to maintain over the long term. And if we couldn't solve the problem of delivery into a sufficiently large number of cells in such a way that we can maintain a long-term antiviral effect, certainly uh, the issues of breakthrough and noncompliance and ease of administration would be made significantly uh, more um, uh, tolerable for patients and hopefully more um, uh, practical in terms of treating the disease. So these studies are ongoing and, and we will uh, simply need to pursue them to see where they take us in the future. Now the last part of my talk I want to mention another genetic approach to another viral disease and that is the uh, disease of hemorrhagic fever caused by Ebola virus. Some of you last night in the session with C.J. Peters may have heard uh, some of his interesting studies that have really been uh, going on for, for quite a long time in this area. And uh, this slide simply takes the highlights and shows you that geographically uh, Ebola virus is largely found in Africa. There have been a few outbreaks in Europe, usually in, associated with, in association with uh, animal colonies. There was an outbreak in Reston, Virginia, in macaques. Fortunately, that uh, outbreak was restricted to primates and no people were infected. But it has been a prob it's been a medical problem that has been uh, clearly um, one that is of some concern for reasons that I'll uh, tell you about in the next slide. The disease is caused by a different type of virus than the ones you've heard about so far in the meeting, filoviruses. Uh, these are single-stranded RNA viruses. They're very pleomorphic. This actually is taken uh, from Bernie Field's virology text and actually CJ uh, wrote the chapter in that book, so he should really be giving this part of the talk more so than I. But uh, the bottom line is that these viruses are highly pleomorphic. Uh, they have variable length. They do have a uniform diameter, most importantly. They actually, again, are remarkably simple in terms of their genetic organization. They have seven genes they, that encode uh, uh, actually eight different products. Now, um, we became interested in this, I, and I'll just briefly say that the reasons that we're concerned about the disease, aside from its virulence, I won't go through this list of the symptoms, the symptoms of the disease are really the symptoms of a bad flu. Uh, the only difference is that at the end of that flu, the disease is really manifest by diffuse infection of large numbers of cells, and in particular cells of the circulatory system, and the endothelial cells that line the circulatory system. It's really the infection of those cells and the ensuing um, uh, circulatory collapse that's responsible for death and the disease. And I'm sure m many of you are aware that this is rather abrupt from the beginning to the end of onset uh, of the disease. And the reason that it's of some concern is that we, we really don't have a good handle on many aspects of its biology. There are no effective antiviral treatments. There are no effective human vaccines. And we really are somewhat perplexed still at what the natural reservoir of the disease is, uh, so that if we wanted to contain it by preventing the reservoir from transmitting it uh, to humans, we really don't have a great idea of how that would be done, although I, I am hopeful that progress is, is being made in that area. But it did occur to us at the time that some of the gene therapy technologies might be applicable to this disease because we did know the virus's genetic structure. Now, one of the most interesting proteins in Ebola virus is its viral glycoprotein. It's, it's interesting in many respects, but I think one of the uh, biologically interesting aspects of it is that it's a gene that can give rise to two different proteins. It makes uh, the DNA and codes an RNA which after the RNA is made can be edited in such a way that a fraction of that RNA gives rise to a second RNA molecule that now encodes a different protein. So the most highly expressed glycoprotein is a secreted form of, glyco of the glycoprotein and it encounters a 
stop codon here to give rise to this uh, approximately 60 kilodalton, 60 to 80 kilodalton protein. Uh, if the transcript is edited, and it occurs uh, about in the first third of the transcript, you then shift the reading frame of the protein so that it, the translation continues. And then in a seven to one ratio, seven parts secreted glycoprotein to one part transmembrane protein, this different protein is made. And for reasons that I'll tell you about, both uh, from a vaccine standpoint as well as the biology of the virus, we thought this would be interesting to pursue. And the approach that we pursued is the one that uh, Bill Jocklick alluded to in his talk, which is uh, this genetic immunization technique where we, whereby we use DNA. This is simple DNA that's grown in the laboratory as a plasmid that's injected into the muscle and provides a mechanism to induce, induce immunity. Now, the way we think this works is that when the needle is injected into the muscle, the DNA gets taken up by the muscle cells. And this then directs the synthesis of the protein, in this case the Ebola virus proteins, that are now taken up by cells of the immune system and presented to the immune system as being foreign. Uh, once these are presented to the immune system as being foreign, it stimulates proliferation of T cells and uh, these T cells then can recognize and uh, lyse the infected target cells or produce antibodies to neutralize the target cell. And I should say, although I'm presenting this for Ebola, I think it's fair to say that this can be applicable to almost any virus that you might want to look at. And again, uh, I think high on everyone's list these days is, is the AIDS virus. But in the case of Ebola virus, what we did together with our collaborators down at the CDC, and this primarily being Tony Sanchez, is we picked some candidate genes that we thought might be useful for genetic immunization. Now, if this is a schematic of the virus structure, we chose the full-length viral glycoprotein, the edited form that I showed you in two slides ago. We also looked at the secreted glycoprotein that's found in the serum at very high concentrations. And we also took one of the internal glycoproteins that is expressed at very high levels. And in some influenza experiments, it was actually shown that some of the nucleoproteins, even though they're found internally in the cell, can be presented to the immune system and can be the targets of immune recognition and antiviral effects. So we began to test whether we could generate immune responses to these. And I'll simply tell you that that could be done quite readily. Uh, and we were able to generate uh, very good um, antibody responses to the nucleoprotein. We were able to generate antibodies to the glycoproteins, though not as, as high levels. Uh, interestingly, we could generate T killer cells. This is a this specific subset of immune cells that can actually lyse cells that express the protein. Although we were unable to generate those cells that could lyse the nu nuclear protein expressing targets. So we basically induced a different type of immune response to each one. And then the question was, by generating these immune responses, could we develop protection against lethal challenge by the virus? And this is where I'm e eternally and grateful to our wonderful collaborators at the CDC. This actually is Tony Sanchez. CJ will probably know this better than anyone else because he's in CJ's division, but I've come to know Tony very well. And if you know Tony and you look at the expression on his face, he looks nervous here. Um, and, and there's a good reason why he should. He's about to step into a, a high-level biocontainment facility to actually inoculate uh, guinea pigs that uh, were immunized using these uh, DNA vaccine approaches. And I, I really can't stress enough how much people like Tony and his colleagues at the CDC, and also the investigators at the Army at Fort Detrick who work on this organism as well, really put themselves out on the line to um, work with needles and animals with these very highly contagious viruses. Uh, Tony uh, did the virus challenge experiment, and I'll summarize uh, those results here in the next slide. And the results were remarkably clear when the experiment was done. And that was that every animal that got immunized with a control plasmid that did not express any of the Ebola glycoproteins died after viral challenge. This occurred roughly one week after the challenge by virus. 
every animal that had generated a good immune response to the viral glycoprotein survived. Those that developed an intermediate response had a proportionally increased survival and it essentially was very well correlated to their ability to make uh, antibodies to this virus. I won't go into the details of the mechanism here, those are under active investigation, but I will say that what this has told us, at least in this model, is that by using a very simple tool, DNA expression vectors that essentially uh, an undergraduate or even a high school student could make in the lab, that we can generate reagents that can have profound impacts on very substantial disease processes. And I think in terms of the applications of this technology to other viral diseases and uh, even to other uh, autoimmune diseases that, that clearly there's a lot to explore there. I should tell you that when we look at these animals that are protected or uh, not protected uh, and we look for evidence of the viral antigen that we see antigen in the infected animals but not in the uninfected animals so that the immunity that we see here is what we would call sterilizing. There's no silent infection in the protected animals. It's simply not there. The virus appears to be eradicated and we're unable to rescue the virus on that term. Now, the last point I'd like to make before uh, Betsy takes over is that um, this has provided a, an inroad to another aspect of the biology of the virus that will prove, I think, to be very useful. Uh, perhaps uh, both in understanding the virus and perhaps also in generating antiviral genes. These are the schematic structures of the two different glycoproteins. And as we now had a source of these proteins in the laboratory, one that we could make using recombinant DNA in a way that was safe, it now allowed us to begin to ask, how do these proteins work? How do they cause the disease? Why does the endothelial cell become targeted? Why does the endothelial cell die? And I won't go through this data in detail, but because this was published uh, earlier this year in, in science. But what we learned is that essentially, much to our surprise, these two glycoproteins, even though they're encoded by the same viral gene, have evolved distinct preferences for different cell types. So for example, what we see is that the secreted glycoprotein binds to neutrophils, the granulocytes that, that generate the inflammatory response uh, to foreign infection. The full-length glycoprotein, which we've actually been able to incorporate into a virus uh, and to infect cells to see whether those cells express the protein, don't infect neutrophils at all. On the other hand, they get into endothelial cells very well but the secreted glycoprotein doesn't get into endothelium at all. So clearly this protein has evolved to affect our inflammatory response to the infection. This one has evolved to target the virus to the endothelium. And in its experiments I won't show, what we've learned is that the glycoprotein actually shows this preferential binding and infection of endothelial cells. So that's a clue because as you may remember from the introductory part of this section, the, the lethal consequences of the disease probably follow from infection of endothelium and circulatory collapse. And the last point I want to leave you with is that we may in fact be able now to understand why in molecular terms this occurs. And what we've done is we've taken a vector, again fortunately because we've had these in the lab for our gene therapy approaches, it's easy to make these and use them as tools in experimental models. And we've made adenoviral vectors that will express the glycoprotein of Ebola virus, we can then take umbilical cord endothelial cells, human umbilical cord endothelial cells, infect them, and look at what effect expression of the glycoprotein has on these cells. And what you can see here is this is a normal endothelial cell culture. It has this cobblestone appearance and all the cells are nicely adherent to the, uh, the bottom of the tissue culture dish. These are the cell cultures that have been infected with the full-length glycoprotein. And you can see that they're all round. This happens uh, within 12 hours after infection by the adenoviral glycoprotein. They all round up. Within 16 hours, they all detach. And within another several hours, they will die. And if we remove a specific region of the protein that we've actually been able to map, that that does not occur at all. That's actually what's shown here, despite the fact that they make 
comparable amounts of this glycoprotein. This is a cell sorter analysis where we can look at the intensity of expression of the glycoprotein on these two different cells compared to a control, and you can see that they're comparable in their expression, but this one is very toxic and this one is not. And so that's given us an insight into how this virus does its damage. It uses its glycoprotein to direct its genetic contents to a specific cell type. And then through that very same gene product, it creates a cytotoxic effect in that cell that kills that cell. And that also gives us a tool now to begin to search for antiviral drugs, drugs that will prevent this from happening, either by preventing the interaction of the glycoprotein with those cells, or by giving drugs that might be what we call cytoprotective, that would protect against the toxic effects of the infection. And the last point I wanted to leave you with, and I won't go through the summary here, is that we now can begin to do things that sound, would have sounded rather outlandish uh, a few years ago. We can take otherwise deadly viruses, and we can take the best of those viruses and leave the worst behind, and now basically uh, turn them into d gene delivery vehicles, which now have very advantageous um, properties. HIV is a lentivirus. It normally causes AIDS. We can modify the lentivirus to take out its toxic genes so that it can serve to deliver the genetic material to, to these cells, uh, but not replicate. We can take the glycoprotein of Ebola virus, and in the laboratory, we can now express the glycoprotein only together with the relevant gene products of HIV, and we can now confer the ability uh, of Ebola virus to bind to endothelial cells uh, and deliver genes to endothelial cells. And here now is another experiment where we've taken a uh, fluorescent marker protein and using this lentiviral vector that's been uh, essentially coated with the Ebola gly virus glycoprotein, we can now very efficiently deliver a protein into endothelial cells. Over 90% of these cells now are expressing this fluorescent uh, tag compared to controls. And this now gives us a mechanism to target genes.